All right, g'day fellow psychologists. In this video, I want to explain how you explain and assess a study on ecological validity properly. Uh, if you're writing an exam answer, if you're evaluating a study, and especially if you're evaluating a true experiment, a laboratory experiment, there's a really good chance you want to write about ecological validity. IB psychology students write about this all the time and they all get it wrong. So if you're studying for your exams, listen up uh, because I want to explain how you do a really good critical evaluation of a psychological study using ecological validity. All right, here's the first step. Most students get this far. They'll say, this study was a laboratory study, so it lacks ecological validity, full stop, end of point, and they say, boom. There's my critical thinking. That's not critical thinking, right? You, you might score one mark, max, possibly. Right? But you have to ask yourself, how long did it take me to come up with that point? How long did it take me to realize that's a lab experiment, lab experiment goes with ecological validity, this is a lab experiment, therefore it lacks ecological validity, about 20 seconds. If it takes you less than a minute, if it takes you less than 10 minutes to come up with a point uh, to evaluate a study, you're probably not thinking critically, right? Critical thinking takes time. And again, if you want to score good marks, there are no easy shortcuts, right? You really have to think critically. So let's go a little bit further. Some students might go one step further and they'll say, this was a laboratory experiment, so it lacks e ecological validity. We're wondering to what extent we can generalize these findings to real life. Okay, so they've gone one step further, they've kind of explained a little bit more about the concept of uh, ecological validity, but it's still really vague. It's still, they've just added another sentence to a very generic, general uh, explanation of ecological validity that could apply to any study. This is not good enough. I mean, this, this again, it might get you one mark, maybe. But it, what we have to do when we're explaining ecological validity is we have to explain why. Why might our results from the lab not apply to a real life situation? And in order to do that, we need to get specific, right? So we need to look at the specific characteristics of the laboratory, and then we have to say, well, what's the, then we have to look at the specific characteristics of a specific real life scenario that we might not expect these results to apply to. Because remember, the reason we conduct laboratory experiments is to explain real life behavior. So let's look at the real life environments in which this behavior occurs, and then we can have uh, a better explanation. Right? And this is you know, the, the basis of generalizability. Ecological validity is a type of generalizability. To what extent do we generalize our findings to a new situation? And here we're just looking at the environment. Um, now that's all a little bit abstract, right? So let me give you a concrete example. Let's take the classic Bobo doll study, right? Bobo doll, right? So you say, well, this is a, a laboratory uh, um, environment experiment. You know, could we apply this to a real life situation? Right, we have to identify what is the real life situation this might not apply to? And so if we're studying kids, and what we're saying here is that, right, in a laboratory, when the kids are in the lab, they watch someone beat up a Bobo doll, and then they, uh, they're gonna copy that aggression. Right, now, how does that happen in a real life situation? Well, let's think of one. All right, where do kids most often see violent behavior? Right, they are, they, and they might get it from the television. All right, so uh, kids are gonna watch, um, so we've got the TV and we've got the living room. Right? This is our real life environment. This is a specific example we've identified. So we're saying, well, would these results apply to this example? And now I have to think, why? What's the difference between these two that makes me think maybe we wouldn't get, you know, it might not apply. And, and, and so if we think carefully a little bit about it, and, you know, this is one I prepared earlier, so I've already, I've already spent some time thinking about it. Um, we say, well, in the Bobo doll study, the kids watched an aggressive model and then they, uh, they, they, they're beating up the Bobo doll and they had all the toys, and then they turn around, and voila, all the exact same toys are there in the room, just like they saw on the television. Now, is that what happens in real life? No, that's not what happens in real life. In real life, we're watching TV, we're watching all sorts of different types of violence. Kids are watching um, cartoon cats get beat up with anvils, and then, uh, you know, if you, uh, the old Looney Tune cartoons, Roadrunner, and uh, things like that. I mean, they don't turn around and there's not a train coming through the, the, their living room, and there's not anvils falling, falling from the sky. There's not cowboys and Indians running through their living room. It's completely different. Uh, and so then we have to ask the question. Another key difference is there's often a delay. <clears throat> Here, it was, it was quite soon, right? It was quite immediate. They watch the aggression, they turn around, and there it is. In the living room, you know, th these kids might be copying this aggression the next day in school, right? That night, they're watching uh, uh, wrestling, you know, the guy tof tof comes off the top rope, next day at playground, that's what they do, right? They had to wait a whole day for that. Um, 
Now we know they do do that. I just gave it a good, good example about why they do. But you know, but does it always apply? <clears throat> and so here we're, we're comparing the difference between the two, right? What are the differences in these two environments, which means maybe it won't apply in this real life situation. And again, we're not saying it won't, right? And I do, I, I want to stress that point. We're not saying it won't apply in the real life situation, but we're saying maybe it won't, right? And maybe we not, might not get the same results. Okay, that's one example. Um, let's look at another one, a classic one. You know, you're probably studying this one for your exam uh, exams as well. Loftus and Palmer, right? The car crash study. Many students will say, this study was a laboratory in, uh, experiment, therefore we can't apply these results uh, to real life. Not critical thinking, what we have to do is identify what's the specific real life scenario in which we might not expect these same results. What the, what's the specific real life scenario where we might expect people will be influenced by leading questions and they would get it wrong? Well, let's think of one. Eyewitness testimony, right? This is often used uh, in to uh, explain why uh, witnesses who are put on put on the uh, witness stand might have false memories. Now, what we have to do is go one step further and think, right? So we've got the um, EWT, right? Eyewitness testimony. Now we're in a courtroom, or maybe we're in the interview room. Um, after a witness has seen the crime, before they've even uh, got to the legal proceedings, right? We're saying, would these results apply to uh, eyewitness testimony, someone who's witnessed a crime and they're giving evidence in a case? So what's the next step? Okay, what's the difference between these two scenarios? That means we might not expect the same results across these two environments. One, stress. Here, if you get the, the, the answer wrong, you guess the wrong speed, what's the consequences? There are none. Here, if you get the wrong question, you get the wrong answer, you, uh, if your memory's not right, what are the consequences? They're big. Right? You're putting an innocent person in jail, you're, you're testifying against a crime. There are massive consequences here for getting the answer wrong, for your memory to be wrong. Now that could influence how much you concentrate, how much you think, it could influence even your physiology which could influence your memory. Huge differences here compared to when we look at just uh, in an ex in a, you know, a bunch of, um, with a, uh, a, a students um, who are doing their driving tests I think. Um, you know, there's a big difference in these two environments and that's why the results might not apply. Now, we can say with pretty good confidence that, that we can um, have these same results in a lot of uh, field studies and a lot of other experiments do suggest it, but if you want to explain ecological validity, that's how you have to do it properly. And it does take careful consideration and this is why I also argue critical thinking is not removed from knowledge. Right? Critical thinking is based on knowledge. In order to think critically, you have to know stuff. So, you know, and because, you know, it's, um, I need to know about eyewitness testimony. I need to know about this environment. I need to know about the TV in the living room. Now, these are pretty common things, but if you didn't know about how um, interviews work or eyewitness testimony or, you know, the legal proceeding, then there's no way I could evaluate the study critically. Now, this is more probably a note for um, teachers and administrators who say that knowledge isn't important in schools, but I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here. But um, you, you, you are connecting disparate uh, aspects of your knowledge here when you're thinking critically. We're saying, well, yeah, we get it here, but what about this extent? And in order to explain it properly, you need to know something about this environment to which you're uh, explaining it to. One last example, um, while, I, while I think of it, right? fMRI. Okay, we're saying, well, yeah, we get these results in an fMRI, but what about a real life environment? And so I use a lot of um, studies in my course and my books about aggression and how they put people in the fMRI and they measure their brain when they're looking at um, threatening faces. This is supposed to mirror threat. And they go, okay, sure, their amygdala and their prefrontal cortex is going to activate that way in a, in a, um, in a machine. But what about in the real life situation when you get in a social threat? Now, again, the next step, right? I have to think about what are the differences in a real life situation, my physical surroundings, compared to the fMRI which might affect those results. And I'm gonna leave you with that one because I don't wanna give you the answer because I want you to think of it critically for yourself. But just think about that physical environment. Think about a specific situation where someone might be acting aggressively and how that might differ, right, to being in a machine and how that might affect your brain. Okay, um, now, one final point. Sometimes, even when I'm trying to uh, come up with examples of ecological validity, I find myself actually not explaining the environment, but I more explain, find myself explaining the procedures. Uh, and this is called uh, mundane realism. I don't know if you can see this, sorry. I'm experimenting with my new board, right? Mundane realism, okay, and then there's also Population validity. Can we uh, apply our results from one population to another, right? One from our sample to uh, another group of people. My advice is don't get caught up in the terminology. And in fact, play it safe and just talk. If you're worried about, you know, am I talking about the procedures here, or is this about the participants, or is this really about the place, the environment? 
just talk about generalizability. Right, to say, you know, um, you begin your evaluation by saying uh, one limitation of the study is that we might be able to uh, question its generalizability. And then you go into your details why. And then by the time you've finished explaining it, maybe you've got a better idea. Yeah, actually, I was, I was talking about the, the procedure there. So you can say, well, maybe we could question this on the, the basis of mundane realism. Maybe we could question this on the basis of ecological validity. But I think those specifics are less important than just saying generalizability. Can we apply the results to a different scenario, a different place? and explain why, right? Final advice before I go, you're not gonna do this with every study. You're not gonna have the time. And in fact, actually, ideally what we want in the IV psychology course is that you can just, without, um, without preparation, you can be given a study and then be able to come, with, come up with this off the cuff. That's the ideal, um, but that's really, really tricky. So uh, what I would suggest is choose maybe three or four maybe five studies that you think that you've that you've planned to use in a lot of different um, topics and a lot of uh, different overlaps right maybe even paper two and paper one um, and and evaluate those based on that and I would also recommend sorry I'm tip after tip here um, but if you're writing about true experiments as your research method um, for the biological approach cognitive approach social cultural if you're writing about the true experiment um, and it's a really good research method to write about then Focus on uh, generalizability and ecological validity as a key limitation, and then you can use a, a similar evaluation to uh, evaluating research methods or if you're evaluating that study in a different exam question. But I'm digressing, I'm going off track, I'm sorry. Um, that's how you explain ecological validity properly. It's more than just saying this was a lab experiment, so it lacks ecological validity. We have to say, right, here's the lab environment, here's the real life environment, which we might not expect the results apply to, and explain why. Good luck for your exams. I hope that helped. Go get them.